Chapter 1. How did we get here? Oh crap, I thought. I really hope I don't forget my lines. It was a sunny morning in San Diego, California. I had my D.A.R.E. t-shirt on, and so did the rest of the students in my 6th grade class, and the one other 6th grade class at my elementary school. It was our official D.A.R.E. graduation. I was a little nervous because all of us 6th graders were about to go up on stage in the auditorium to sing the D.A.R.E. song in front of over a 100 parents. We practiced it so much that nearly 30 years later, I still remember some of the lyrics. It went something like this, with the hilarious late 80s music style. Quote, Dare to keep kids off drugs. Dare to just say no. Dare to make this pledge and let our minds and bodies grow. Then it had all these call and response phrases like, Wanna pop a lewd? No way, dude. PCP will thrill you. Man, that stuff will kill you. Want to snort a line? No thanks, I'm fine. And it ended with something like, Dare tells us so. It's our right to say no. When I was 11 years of age, I was exposed to the Drug Abuse Resistance Education, Dare, program at my elementary school. The main purpose of Dare was to teach peer resistance and refusal skills to adolescents so they could learn to just say no to drugs. Along with this primary goal, Dare also strived to enhance students' social skills and self-esteem. I remember proudly wearing my Dare t-shirt to school every Thursday, at which time we had weekly classes educating us on the dangers of using drugs. After completing the Dare program, I didn't want to use drugs of any kind, especially heroin. For me, this king of drugs evoked an image of a homeless street addict who was passed out and living under a bridge and totally messed up. No thank you, I thought. I will never be a drug addict. I started high school in San Diego, California in the fall of 1994, and I was still a drug-free and proud of it dare graduate. I loved surfing and playing guitar more than anything at that point in my life. I attended Point Loma High School, which was often referred to as Pot Loma or Joint Loma, in reference to the high percentage of students that smoked marijuana. It was common for students to smoke pot or take LSD before and even during school hours. Many of the jocks and other popular kids would use alcohol and cocaine at parties, though these drugs were not as commonly used as marijuana. I hadn't even heard of prescription drugs such as Vicodin or Percocet back then. Nowadays, things are much, much different. Opioid drugs such as hydrocodone, oxycodone, heroin, and even fentanyl are frequently used in some schools in the same fashion that marijuana was popular when I went to school. A public health crisis. Addiction to opioid drugs such as heroin, fentanyl, and prescription painkillers like Vicodin, Percocet, Oxycontin, etc. is now a global health crisis. It negatively affects the health, social, and economic well-being of all humanity. With an estimated 25 to 35 million or more individuals abusing opioids worldwide, this phenomenon has been referred to as a public health epidemic. Upon further examination of some disturbing statistics, I view opioid addiction as a plague that is sweeping across the U.S. and other nations with merciless force. This plague is unbiased, as it doesn't care about race, sex, age, culture, income, location, values, beliefs, and any other demographics or psychographics. No one is exempt. But it was not always this out of control. Opioid statistics, numbers and facts. In 2019, nearly 50,000 people in the United States died from opioid-involved overdoses. The misuse of and addiction to opioids, including prescription pain relievers, heroin, and synthetic opioids such as fentanyl, is a serious national crisis that affects public health as well as social and economic welfare. In fact, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that the total economic burden of prescription opioid misuse alone in the United States is $78.5 billion, with a B, a year. That's $78.5 billion a year estimated, including the costs of health care, lost productivity, addiction treatment, and criminal justice involvement. Here are some of the main opioid statistics. About 130 Americans die every day from an opioid overdose. Since 1999, the sale of opioid painkillers has skyrocketed by more than 300%. 
About 20% to 30% of people who take prescription opioids misuse them. About 10% of people who misuse prescription opioids become addicted to opioids. Approximately 2.1 million Americans have an opioid use disorder. About 5% of people with an opioid use disorder will try heroin. Starting in the late 1990s and leading up to present day, more than half of a million people have died from an opioid overdose. Overdose deaths exploded to more than 90,000 in 2020, and synthetic opioids were involved in more than 60% of all overdose deaths. The birth of the opioid crisis. How did we get here? Up until the early 1990s, the U.S. consumed almost no opioids whatsoever, then quickly got to a point where we used 83% of the world's oxycodone and almost 98% of the world's hydrocodone. In my favorite documentary on the opioid epidemic, called Chasing Heroin, Barry Meyer, author of Painkiller, comments on the general view relating to pain relief and its treatment with opioids prior to the 1990s. Quote, In this country, there was a long-running puritanical attitude towards pain, and it resulted in almost a barbaric under-treatment of pain, particularly when it came to people with cancer and in the terminal stages of cancer. End quote. For a long time, doctors had avoided treating pain with opioids due to fear of addicting their patients. That all changed with the new developments in the hospice movement. In Chasing Heroin, Scott Burris, director of the Temple University Centers for Health Law, identifies the catalyst that started the boom in prescription opioid sales. Quote, That movement collides with an opportunistic drug company in the form of Purdue Pharma. They see the opportunity to expand the use of these drugs beyond the cancer wards, come into the mainstream of medicine, and the drug that becomes the vehicle through which they do that is a drug called Oxycontin, end quote. In another clip of Chasing Heroin, author Sam Quinones states, There is no question that the marketing of Oxycontin was the most aggressive marketing of a narcotic drug ever undertaken by a pharmaceutical producer. The FDA allowed them to make the claim that because it was a long-acting drug, it might, the stress being on the word might, be less prone to addiction and abuse than traditional drugs. There was absolutely no science to support this idea. Zero. End quote. The deception. After getting FDA approval, now it was time to trick the doctors into believing Oxycontin wasn't addictive. Purdue Pharma launched a series of promotional videos in an effort to encourage doctors to treat pain with opioids. Here's what happens on a few of these promotional videos, which were shown in Chasing Heroin. A prominent pain specialist assuredly claims, quote, the likelihood that the treatment of pain using an opioid drug, which is prescribed by a doctor, will lead to addiction is extremely low, end quote. While another doctor is talking, large text appears on the video that reads, quote, Less than 1% of patients become addicted, end quote. Voices of a male and female narrator on the video convincingly state, quote, Opioids are safe and effective medicines for treating chronic pain, and the undertreatment of pain is a major public health problem, end quote. I find it ironic and very sad that a marketing campaign focused on convincing doctors that the undertreatment of pain was a major public health problem, in fact, led to a real public health epidemic of deadly consequence. By 2001, Purdue Pharma was selling more than a billion, with a B, dollars worth of Oxycontin a year. That also set the stage for more prescriptions being written for drugs like Percocet and Vicodin, and consequently, sales of these increased significantly. Pill abuse and addiction reached an all-time high, and newscasters in the media were referring to it as Pharmageddon. Luckily, Purdue Pharma didn't get away with their deception. In 2007, after a four-year investigation by federal prosecutors, Purdue admitted to charges of fraudulent marketing. They were ordered to pay $600 million in fines and settlements, but the damage was already done and the epidemic wasn't slowing down. Federal officials said the internal Purdue Pharma documents showed that company officers recognized that, even before the drug was marketed, they would face stiff resistance from doctors concerned about the potential of a narcotic like Oxycontin to be abused by patients. As a result, prosecutors charged, the company effectively started a fraudulent and deceptive marketing campaign 
aimed at convincing doctors that OxyContin, because of its time-release formula, was less prone to abuse and that it was less likely to cause addiction or to produce other narcotic side effects than competing drugs. In its plea argument, the company Purdue Pharma acknowledged to doing so. According to prosecutors, some Purdue Pharma supervisors and employees used fraudulent techniques to promote OxyContin to doctors. For instance, when the painkiller was first approved, FDA officials allowed Purdue Pharma to state the time-released nature of a narcotic like OxyContin, quote, is believed to reduce, end quote, its potential to be abused. But some Purdue sales representatives falsely told doctors that the statement meant that OxyContin was less likely to lead to addiction or abuse than traditional, fast-acting painkillers like Percocet. In addition, some company sales officials gave doctors misleading scientific charts to support such fraudulent claims. Also, Purdue Pharma trained its sales representatives on how to overcome concerns by doctors that OxyContin could be easily abused, according to the transcript of a training tape made for Purdue Pharma sales officials. Purdue Pharma also knew, prosecutors charged, that large quantities of oxycodone could be easily extracted from oxycotton so the drug could be intravenously injected by drug addicts. I was intrigued and upset when I learned how this opioid epidemic started. To put it simply, brothers and co-owners of Purdue Pharma, Raymond and Mortimer Sackler, decided that riches were more important than morality, and hundreds of thousands have lost their lives and millions of people and their families have been negatively affected. As a result, the heroin epidemic. Unfortunately, things have gotten even worse over the past several years. Painkiller addiction paved the way for Mexican drug suppliers. They would soon add to the opioid epidemic by flooding inexpensive and potent heroin into towns and suburbs across the nation. In Chasing Heroin, Sam Quinones states, quote, They were the first market to understand that the pill market was essentially priming the heroin market. Anywhere there was a town that had a lot of pill users, they would set up a store, end quote. This is where things started to get even more out of control. Prescription opioids were often expensive and low in supply. Thus, many individuals ended up turning to heroin. I relate to this on a very personal level, as this was exactly what happened to me. I was heavily addicted to pills when I was 30 years old. I was living in upstate New York at the time. I was a full-time cook at a busy restaurant, and I was a single dad to a newborn baby girl. Oxycontin and other prescription opioids were very expensive, so expensive and addicting for me that I sold off my music gear, borrowed money, lied, and a few times even stole from the cash register to pay for my pills. I wasn't doing these shady behaviors because I wanted to get high. While that would certainly be a bonus, the simple reason I was doing whatever I could to buy pills was to avoid running out and getting sick. Something I experienced once up to that point and never ever so long as I lived wanted to experience the opioid withdrawal syndrome again. It was the most horrific experience of my life, period. After a few years of pill addiction in New York, I moved back to San Diego, California. I found two people that sold their opioid prescription pills as a side hustle and would purchase them until one day I could no longer find them. The Percocet, Norco, and other pills I had been getting regularly dried up, and at that same time, I met someone that sold heroin. I was at a grass area overlooking the Pacific Ocean on a Friday night at 10 p.m., and my girlfriend at the time asked him if he could get any ecstasy. No, but I can get H, he said. Music to my ears, since I had smoked it and snorted it in the past more than a handful of times. Thus, I started smoking black tar heroin daily and went downhill from there. The Fentanyl Epidemic Unfortunately, heroin was not the worst of our problems. Several years ago, Chinese drug cartels, along with Mexican cartels, began producing and trafficking large quantities of fentanyl, they also started pressing fake oxycotton and other pills that are cut with fentanyl. The fentanyl crisis continues to grow every year, and it's the main reason the overdose rate and death rate has skyrocketed so much. Fentanyl is often up to a hundred times stronger than morphine. And worse still, many of the people buying opioids illegally from a dealer 
are getting heroin or pills that are cut with fentanyl and sometimes even 100% fentanyl. Fentanyl is cheap to make, so there is a much higher profit margin. Plus, even if some customers overdose and die, there is never a shortage of opioid-addicted individuals to sell to. Damage Control Opioid addiction is running rampant in this society as well as many others. The numbers of opioid-addicted individuals, emergency room visits, overdose deaths, incarcerations, and admissions to rehab facilities have been on the rise for a long time. And nowadays, things are only getting worse and not better. In attempt to help these opioid-dependent individuals, agonist and antagonist medications have become readily available and pretty easily accessible to the masses. Scientific research has established that medication-assisted treatment of opioid addiction is associated with decreases in the number of overdoses from heroin abuse, increases retention of patients in treatment, and decreases drug use, infectious disease transmission, and criminal activity. Yet, despite all of these encouraging statistics, the opioid addiction plague is still growing. And while the advent of these medications has certainly enabled many individuals to get their lives back on track, what we are now witnessing is an army of people that are stuck on Suboxone, Subutex, and Methadone. Though a very small percentage of people have decided they want to be on these medications for the rest of their lives, the vast majority want off at some point, and many of them right now or yesterday or years ago. However, getting off these drugs is often easier said than done, as these medications are often more difficult to come off than the opioids people were previously using. In fact, a large percentage of the visitors to my website are looking for information on how they can get off medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. Over the years, I've corresponded with a plethora of individuals that only planned on using these medications short-term, yet here they are, 5 to 10 years or even 15 years or longer later, still dependent to opioids, desperately seeking advice on how they can discontinue these medications without getting sick. I relate to their struggles on a very personal level, because I too was once stuck on Suboxone longer than I anticipated. And what's more, within a few months of coming off Suboxone the first time, I was back to snorting oxycodone again. Thus my addiction quickly resurfaced. Many others have endured the same fate. Self-treatment using Kratom. When I first started blogging about opioid addiction and recovery in the spring of 2014, one of the first articles I wrote was on the use of a natural plant called Kratom. I had learned about Kratom benefits for opioid withdrawal from a past patient of mine at the opioid treatment clinic that I had worked at as a counselor. Kratom, which you'll learn more about in a later chapter, is in the coffee family and is native to Thailand where it grows abundantly. It's a partial opioid agonist, meaning that even though it doesn't come from the opium poppy plant, it still activates the same opioid receptors that traditional opioids activate. This opioid receptor activation leads to similar effects, pain relief, euphoria, constipation, constricted pupils, etc. When I first started blogging, Kratom was still under the radar. Sure, there were plenty of Americans using it, but compared to how it would be in a few years, it was nothing. Due to the rise of bloggers as major influencers and many bloggers writing articles on Kratom, and yet many were not writing about the potential dangers of Kratom, such as Kratom dependence and risk for psychological addiction as well, by 2016, Kratom had become very, very popular, and an estimated 2 million U.S. citizens were reported to be Kratom users. The majority of Kratom users take it for opioid addiction or pain relief or both. However, it's also used for many other things like ADHD, depression, anxiety, and much more. And now that we're coming up on the year 2022, it seems at times like just as many people are addicted to Kratom or using Kratom responsibly as there are people on Suboxone or other opioids. Silent Epidemic to Mainstream Knowledge for many years, the opioid epidemic was a silent one. Then, around 2016, it became mainstream knowledge as the coverage behind it by news and television rose to an all-time high. It was around this time that the CDC also released new opioid prescribing guidelines. Now, it became much harder to get prescribed opioids as a first therapy for pain relief. 
It also became more difficult to get on high dosages of opioids. When this happened, I received so many emails from chronic pain patients that were fuming with anger. They blamed these new guidelines on the opioid-addicted individuals that were abusing the drugs. And it was common for me to hear that people's daily dosage for pain had been cut down dramatically, either quickly or over the span of weeks or months. The reasoning behind these new prescribing guidelines was that less opioids prescribed would lead to less new cases of addiction and less overdose deaths. However, it seems that all it really did was increase the number of people buying pills illegally, as well as increase the number of people switching over to heroin, kratom, and fentanyl. COVID lockdowns and the opioid epidemic. The opioid epidemic was showing signs of slowing down a little bit, and then the COVID pandemic hit. Unfortunately, the fear, social isolation, loss of work, debilitation of the economy, inability for in-person treatment, and many other factors have undoubtedly contributed to the huge spike in rates of OUD, opioid overdose deaths, and drug and alcohol addiction and overdose rates in general in 2020 and as we begin to end the 2021 year as I type these words. Why is the opioid epidemic still getting worse? One of the main reasons the opioid crisis is still getting worse is the COVID pandemic, and every time it looks like things are getting better, a new variant and lockdown order comes in. For example, a few days ago was the first day the Omicron variant was reported on almost every or every mainstream news channel. Another reason is limited access to treatment. For as many people that are addicted to opioids, one would think every town would have a treatment program or addiction medicine physician. However, this is far from the case. Treatment programs are not easily accessible for a large portion of the U.S., and that's just one of the many problems we're facing. Yet another important reason is the low success rates, and thus high failure rates, of traditional treatment approaches. By that, I mean mainstream, abstinence-based, non-medication-assisted treatment approaches, which is abstinence-only instead of harm reduction. Additionally, only around 1 in 10 people seek treatment for opioid use disorder. A main reason for this is the stigma associated with addiction. Additionally, navigating treatment options and efficacy of treatment options is a daunting and very formidable task, even for the most intelligent and resourceful folks. It can be hard to get insurance to pay for the treatment you need at times, and sometimes you even have to pay all cash if you want a certain type of treatment. Another big reason the epidemic is only getting worse is the war on drugs. Since Ronald Reagan and his wife started this war several decades ago, it has done nothing other than waste a fortune of money and continue to treat people with addictions like criminals. Illegal use of opioids is considered and treated as a criminal offense rather than a public health issue. Since unprescribed prescription opioids, heroin, and fentanyl are illegal and criminalized, drug cartels and dealers are able to make lots of money, sometimes and usually a fortune, by providing the products that are in such high demand. Since they are illegal and there is risk of getting caught and going to prison, the price is jacked up way higher than these drugs are worth. Personal drug use being criminalized increases crime, including murders, and the drug user often spends most of their money on their drugs, which is money that they don't invest into making our economy greater. Additionally, a lot of the drugs are cut with all sorts of crap, and at times, you might not be getting anything close to what you were told it was. For example, all the fentanyl nowadays... People think they're buying oxycodone or heroin or other pills or opioids when really it's mostly fentanyl, if not all fentanyl, or carfentanyl, or something else. And for drug users that have insurance, they can typically get into a program, but depending on the insurance you have, this might be difficult. Or you might still have to pay some money out of pocket. Furthermore, a lot of the higher quality addiction recovery facilities are very expensive. So most insurance plans won't cover it. What's the solution? Free treatment, of course. End the unsuccessful war on drugs. I'm of the opinion that we should decriminalize the personal use of drugs. In my imaginary perfect world, drug dealing and drug trafficking would still be a criminal offense. However, 
individuals that take drugs for personal use only would not have to go to jail or prison and would be directed to treatment programs instead. According to Jonathan Rothwell, senior economist at Gallup, quote, During the period from 1993 to 2011, there were 3 million admissions into federal and state prisons for drug offenses. Over the same period, there were 30 million arrests for drug crimes, 24 million of which were for possession. A combination of approaches to policing, prosecution, sentencing, criminal justice, and incarceration is resulting in higher costs for taxpayers, less opportunity for affected individuals, and deep damage to hopes for racial equality, end quote. In the U.S., it costs anywhere between $20,000 to $40,000 and up per year to house inmates in federal and state correctional facilities. That's a lot of money, especially to spend on housing inmates that are only in jail or prison for personal use of drugs. My belief is we should decriminalize personal use of drugs across the board and use all of the money we'd save on creating free treatment programs paid for by the state or federal government. Portugal did exactly this in 2001, and the results have been nothing short of a miracle. Here are some encouraging post-decriminalization stats from Portugal. Decrease in levels of drug use. Decrease in rate of drug use. Decrease in drug-related deaths. Decrease in HIV infections. Increase in people seeking drug treatment. Will the U.S. government ever end the war on drugs? I don't think anytime soon. It's supplying too many people with jobs, and it's not easy to give up and admit that it was a huge failure for all of these decades. America seems to be obsessed with war, war with other countries and nations, war against people with addictions. After all, there's a big profit in the war industry, but it's a big reason the opioid epidemic is still getting worse instead of better. In an interview with world-renowned addiction medicine physician, Dr. Gabor Mate, he states, Just to clarify, there is not a war on drugs. There is a war on drug addicts. New image of individual with an opioid addiction. Back in my sixth grade DARE class, I thought I would never use drugs, and especially heroin. My idea of an opioid addict brought up images of a dirty homeless person that lived under a bridge and was passed out with a needle in his arm. When I was 22, I tried my first painkiller. It was a 5 milligram tablet of hydrocodone. I had never even heard of it before, but it sounded fun to try. I also had no clue that it was in the same class of drugs as heroin, opioids. I loved the Vicodin right from the start, but it wasn't until I was 30 years old that my opioid addiction began. I was a full-time cook, a single dad, had my own two-bedroom apartment, and had a huge circle of friends. I also met other opioid addicts in that small town in Norwich, New York, within a few months of using pills daily. Some even used heroin. My new image of an opioid addict changed. I realized that anyone can become addicted to pills, and even heroin. Years later, I quit for good, worked as a counselor at an opioid treatment program, where I did intakes and counseling sessions for likely more than 500 people over the years. The opioid epidemic was in full force. From that big population of patients, I saw firsthand that opioids didn't care about age, sex, race, culture, religion, money, or any other variable. Anyone and everyone with a brain that tries opioids can become addicted, and no one is exempt from this possibility. Currently in the U.S., Around 130 people die every day from opioid overdose, and more than 2 million people have opioid use disorder. And despite all of the damage opioids are doing to our nation, one might come to the conclusion that opioids are evil. This assumption, however, would be false. Actually, opioids are neither good nor bad. It's an individual's relationship to opioids that can be good, bad, empowering, disempowering, or neutral. Let's discuss this further in chapter two.